Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. And I want to talk about some thyroid-friendly foods that can help you stabilize your blood sugar. <laughs> so blood sugar, having it steady is super critical for your energy levels, for your mood, for your body weight, for your long-term disease risk, you know, critical thing. And how do you know if yours is good or not? Let's talk a bit about just some simple blood sugar testing and what you'd want to find with that. So for starters, I want to make a distinction between normal and optimal. So guidelines say that here's a normal reference range. There are times to where, yep, that's better than not being there, but you may not be at your full best yet. So I want to think about both. They're both important considerations. So one, one version of testing is spot glucose testing. And you can do that very easily with the glucometer. You can buy these things in the pharmacy for, boy, 20 bucks, and the slides end up being a dollar a piece. It's a pretty easy thing to do at home. It's very low cost, and it's an awesome tool to really evaluate short-term progress with your health. When you wake up in the morning, before you've had any food, before you've had coffee, that's your morning fasting glucose. You can check that very simply. And normal is considered below 99. Well, you're better below it than above it. Um, 99, actually 100, to 114 is called impaired glucose tolerance. 115 to 126 is prediabetes, and consistent readings above 126 are considered diabetes. So I'd love to see you more like 70, 85, mid 70s, mid 80s for an optimal range of that morning fasting glucose. The other version is what's called the postprandial blood sugar. That's just like after a meal. So when you eat, your sugar does go higher, completely normal. Now this one, we've also got a spread between normal and optimal. So 200 and above is considered diabetic on consistent readings. Uh, there's not a lot of other definitions as far as what's good or bad or shades of gray. You're either wonderful or you're diabetic as far as postprandial goes. Now optimal, probably 120. You, know, you wouldn't want to go much above that on a consistent basis. So to measure that, same thing, you'd poke your finger, use a little slide, and do that between one to two hours after a meal. Some people, they're really going to spike in that first hour. Others, it might be two hours afterwards. So you may check it a couple of times to know just where yours tends to run and then follow that one afterwards. You know, if that's not too unusual, I would pay the most attention to your morning fasting. And as your diet, you go under, undergo a good dietary change or you train harder, you can watch and see how that affects your morning fasting blood sugar. So what are some symptoms of your blood sugar being off? Well, I learned the term hangry not too long ago, like hungry and angry all jum jumbled together. Yeah, you can feel shaky or disoriented, general anxiety, hunger, moodiness, energy crashes. Those are all ones that people think about and often do recognize. But some people don't think about as much. Um, insomnia, you know, bad migraines, muscle pain, that's kind of a wild one. Um, shoulder pain, frozen shoulder. So someone would come and say, hey, I've, uh, my shoulder hurts. I'm like, okay, what's happening? Uh, did you do something? No, not really. You know, no unusual exercise, no movements. It's just stiff and it can't move very well. Boy, that's a big sign of a blood sugar problem, oftentimes early diabetes. So then we think about diseases associated with abnormal blood, blood sugar. Of course, diabetes, heart disease, many cancers, dementia, skin aging, cardiovascular risk, kidney damage, liver damage. So big thing. And for those with thyroid disease, this is just super, super important. They're really prone to develop diabetes, to have blood sugar problems, and have more of these complications. So let's talk about just categories of foods first off and how categories of foods affect your blood sugar. Star of the show would be the proteins. They do so many good things on helping stabilize blood sugar, slowing gastric emptying, diminishing insulin response. So they're awesome to have. And a rule around my house has been to start with your protein. You know, I always had the kids do that. We would first protein, then veggies, and, and then, then carbs. And, you know, not always like in a perfect sequence, but they were, when they were very little, whatever types of even good carbs, they would often want to go to that first and like, oh, I'm full, I'm too full for veggies. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> so let's start with the protein then if that's a concern. So and then we think about fats as well. Polyunsaturates and monounsaturates, some of those are really good. They reduce the hunger hormones. They reduce cholecystokinin. They also do a good job delaying gastric emptying. And the more unsaturated fats also improve insulin resistance. Saturated fats are different. Now, this is a distinction. There's many in the health space that are advocating saturated fats as good foods. 
And I'll be the first to say they're not as bad as many made them out to be. The biggest studies have shown they're probably not more dangerous than sugar. But that's still not a good thing. That's not like a high bar. They have been shown to worsen insulin resistance and raise risks for fatty liver. So I'm by no means frightened of having some butter or some fatty animal fat, but don't make that the main source of your fat. We've got the best data about olive oil, monounsaturates being the mainstay for improving diabetes and lowering total mortality risk and benefiting body weight as well. Then we think about carbs too as a big category. The old idea was carbs were all bad and you just want to completely avoid them across the board. So we now know that no, your body has to have glucose and either you'll get them from carbs in your diet or you'll make them from your liver. So you want to have good slow burning carbs, they're healthy. Resistant starch foods are great. Uh, things like green banana flour, potatoes are wonderful, white beans. We've put a lot of that into our daily reset shake for that reason as well. So let's jump into some of the top foods. These, these are some of my favorites. Uh, number 12, okra. <laughs> yeah, you can get this, the whole little pod, you can chop it up, or you can get it frozen pre-chopped. So this is slimy, <laughs> and slimy is good. I want you to think of slimy as being good with food. Slimy is mucilage, it's polysaccharides, it's good things that soothe the intestinal tract and cause you to not make so much insulin after meals. So okra, but also things like uh, prickly pericactus like we've got in the southwest is pretty similar for that. Number 11 would be flax seeds. So many positive things. They've got that same slimy mucilage, lots of great lignans as well. The ground seeds work best for these purposes and you can add them into liquids or, or shakes or smoothies or just drink them right on down. That works fine too. A couple tablespoons a day is a huge benefit. Number 10, um, eggplant. This is a food that uh, it's a healthy food. It's got wonderful soluble fiber, uh, very slowly absorbed calories, and I'm just enamored by it. I'm not sure why. It's not even rational how much I like eggplant, but I do. I'm a big fan. And it's not on there just because of that. It's actually a really good food in its own right. Lots of good data on it benefiting blood sugar. Easy thing to include. Number nine would be green banana flour, and that's that resistant starch source. This is really good stuff. It tastes like bananas. There's a brand called Weibo you can buy on Amazon pretty easily and add it into your shakes, to your hot cereals, anything you want like that, and it's so good. Number eight would be oat bran. This was an exciting food in the 80s, and somewhere along the way it got forgotten about, but so much data about oat bran lowering cholesterol, benefiting blood sugar, doing a good job for the gut flora, being one of the highest known sources of soluble fiber, also having some resistant starch, so great thing to include. Number seven, sardines. Sardines, you cannot beat them as far as being a clean source of protein, good source of omega-3 fats, and also rich in many important minerals like magnesium. That is when you do the ones that have the little tiny bones and chew up the bones. <laughs> Number six would be zuki beans. These are also super high in magnesium. They're also a quick to cook bean and they're crazy tasty. I love to make these with a little bit of a sea vegetable called kombu, which gives it that unani, savory type flavor. Uh, in Chinese medicine, they were tonics for the kidneys and longevity, but great stuff. Number five would be kabocha squash. This is a big favorite of mine. Who made these? <laughs> did I make this list? Of course I did. Kabocha squash. Uh, if you've had various squashes, Sometimes the texture of like an acorn squash could leave you feeling a little bit sour. Uh, many don't like that texture. I love kabocha's texture. It's so different. It's got a really nice, hmm, not quite meaty, but it's a lot more firm than your typical, typical squashes are. A great source of soluble fiber, nice source of slow absorbed carbs, lots of beta carotene as well, and good source of zinc. Number four would be buckwheat. Uh, this is a wonderful food. This one has some special effects on benefiting the liver, and that's from its high level of bioflavonoids, especially hesperitin, methylchalcone, and rutin. So this is not categorized as a grain, it's actually a grass seed, and easy thing to cook up, great healthy, good carb, and wonderful to include in the meals. Number three would be avocados. So lots of soluble fiber, those good monounsaturates, B6, nice and filling, Easy thing to include in a meal. You know, my, um, one of my favorite go-to meals 
well, I don't want to take away from number two or number one, especially number one. So I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to that. Number two would be beet greens. So this is one of the highest known sources of potassium. This is also very rich in vitamin K. These both benefit blood sugar metabolism and really tasty stuff. Beets are great food. Buy the whole beets, get the betaine, all those great benefits, but then also use the greens. Okay, so drum roll for number one. So remember avocados, I was talking about how I like to use those. So my, my go-to staple meal would be avocados, some cooked turkey, and boiled potatoes. Throw in some beet greens, stir that up. <laughs> I love it, it's crazy. So potatoes, yeah, they've gotten a really bad rap. You know, somewhere along the way, I'm not sure how, but potatoes are thought to be a unhealthy, bad carb. And now, mind you, uh, french fries and potato chips are nobody's friend. <laughs> the potatoes have so much going for them. They're actually one of the highest sources of resistant starch you can find. Um, there was a study done on satiety of food, so how long a food fills you up. And this is something we make assumptions about. I've heard some experts say, oh, fat fills you up for six hours and protein fills you up for two hours, carbs fill you up for one hour. It's, no, I'm sorry, that's, no. <laughs> This has been studied, and they've actually given lots of people foods, and then afterwards said, hey, when are you hungry? How much longer did it take you to get hungry? But also then tracked and saw how much they ate at their next meal. So how long it took before they got hungry, and how much food they ate afterwards. That data was compiled into the satiety index. Most foods were in the one to 200 range. A few foods were, you know, low 200s. That was kind of exceptional. Potatoes were like 330. They were in a class completely by themselves. There is no foods that have been shown to make you feel full longer on fewer calories than potatoes. <laughs> there is the whole nightshade thing that you'll hear about. You know, nightshades are deadly poisonous things. They have these alkaloids that can hurt you and cause arthritis. Well, it's plausible, but it's not probable. Now, the one thing you could do wrong is eat potatoes that have a lot of the eyes or a lot of green skin. You can get nightshades from that. It's honestly a really easy thing to work around. Get yourself nice, fresh, organic potatoes, cut out any eyes, cut out any weird stuff, and you're fine. You're totally golden. Um, alkaloid poisoning from Solanaceae has occurred in the past when people ate contaminated old potatoes. It's not happened since the 50s. And that's not, these alkaloids do not bioaccumulate. So it's not that a little bit over time mounts up, no. A lot <coughs> can do you in, but otherwise it's really not relevant. They're such good foods. So then we think about foods to avoid that can goof up your blood sugar. Well, obviously we got processed sugar. So that gives you the cravings. It puts you on that whole sugar roller coaster. And I've talked more about that in other articles and, and videos. Another big one is also alcohol. Now I know many think about wine as being a health food. I'll talk about that separately. Um, it does not benefit blood sugar. It actually makes your liver dump out more sugar, and it's got a lot of sugar all by itself. And the same thing is true for caffeine. Caffeine actually causes your muscles to break down their glycogen and pour that in the bloodstream. So having a cup of coffee, even without sugar, it's kind of like drinking sugar. And that's how it gives you that boost because your blood sugar is shot up really fast. Last big thing to avoid would be flour products. So even healthy things like, say, the buckwheat I talked about, made into flour, that's absorbed faster, and that changes your blood sugar dynamics. So hope your blood sugar is steady, your energy is smooth, and you're feeling great. I wish you all the best for your health today and also deep into your future. I'm Dr. Christensen, and I'll talk with you real soon.